In John chapter 4, um, 23, Jesus said, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For their Father is seeking such people to worship him. You know, it came after just a moment when the Samaritan woman said, But don't you Jews say you're meant to worship in the temple? Jesus was saying, It doesn't matter where you worship from. It matters about the state of your heart. That's where worship comes from. That's what the Father's looking for. So today, whether you're in a living room, whether you're outside, no matter where you are, we just love the fact that we can worship together. We don't need to be in a church building. We are... My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you home. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore. Doubts in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, in the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will.
even in this moment, God's building his kingdom. Even in this moment, this is a good one to pray for revival. So let's do it Irish style. Let's sing an Irish hymn together. Come say you rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we may come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now as we are your church and we need your power. All right, let's go. We seek your key. folks we're socially distant right now so we can't do things uh exactly the way that we would if we were there with you in person that doesn't mean we're not going to make a wee effort here to have a little bit of irish shin diggery that's a real word look that up why don't you get your arm around whoever you've got near you right now whoever your lockdown partners are why don't you just uh get your arm around them give them a wee snuggle and uh Let's celebrate the kingdom of God together. We're still doing this thing, even in the middle of this weird moment. We're still building the kingdom of God. We believe he still has plans for us to prosper us, not to harm us. That's worth celebrating. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show you.
might have worked out by now, we're big believers in joy. We believe in the truth of scripture. We believe that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's lift up that truth over our circumstances right now. Let's sing it out, come on. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Though the world is rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart. Well, hello, church. We count it a great privilege to be with you, to worship with you, um, and your church.
good morning, Park Ridge. Yeah. We welcome you all here this morning. As we get ready, we'll just ask that you just please put on your face masks as we sing together. All right, so yeah, everybody just put on your face masks as we uh, worship here this morning. We're going to start off with Open Up the Heavens. My weapon. 
Happen is a melody. Raise on hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Now I'm gonna sing. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes.
Church, we want to welcome you to Park Ridge Free Methodist Church. We're so glad that you've come to be with us today to worship our Lord and Savior and celebrate our beautiful new pastor, Mary. What a beautiful time to come together on this chilly fall day. And I'm grateful. Heavenly Father, just inhabit our praises. Let us worship you in spirit and truth. For you are our blessed assurance. In Jesus' name. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchased of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood, perfect submission, all is at rest, I am my soul. Sing it out. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my soul. Savior, 
doing shoe boxes. There are some empty boxes out in the cafe area that inside the boxes you will find all the instructions. If you prefer to use, and we're limited, there's a few more than what's there, but um, we don't have a lot of boxes this year. If you choose to fill your own box on the table in the back of the lobby are the instructions, labels, or you can actually go online to Samaritan's Purse and I think it's $25. You can fill your shoe box. You can choose toys to put in it and they put in school supplies and different things like that. So that's our announcements. Um, I'm pleased to stand here in, for, in representing the board to introduce Pastor Mary. Um, and she's gonna be our new lead pastor. She started Monday in the office and today's her first Sunday with us. She's also here with her daughter, Jessica. So I'm going to ask Pastor Mary if you can just come up to over here. Um, you probably saw in the newsletter, Pastor Mary is a Rochester native. Um, she was raised in East Irondequoit, and she's made a big circle to come back here, coming through Florida, Pennsylvania, most recently West Seneca, out by Buffalo. Um, we have a few things here we'd like to welcome you with. Um, hold on a second. This is a, a group effort. People in the congregation, the church have all put this together. And Jessica, when I walk by, I'm going to drop something off to you too. So, <laughs> but we look forward to what's ahead now that you're here with us. Um, we're ha very happy to have you. Um, again, normally we would gather around you, but I'm going to ask that you who are sitting here and anybody who's watching at home to just reach out your hands towards Pastor Mary um, as we pray for her. Heavenly Father, we lift Pastor Mary up to you here as the new pastor of Park Ridge. We pray that you will bless her leadership. She's coming here at a very difficult time, Lord, and as with this pandemic, and we ask first for the healing of this virus and that we can return to our normal activities. We pray that you help Pastor Mary as she tries to get to know the congregation behind all our masks. And um, Lord, please bless Jessica as well as she's coming to Rochester and she's also searching for a job because of COVID took hers. Um, thank you, Father, for directing Pastor Mary to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So after, after um, just before the ushers dismiss us at the end, Pastor Mary, I would just ask you to go out so people can meet you. And again, COVID changes things, so we're not having a lunch, we don't have cake, we don't have cookies, but we do have a little goodie bag, so I'll come out there too and I'll hand the little treat bags out as you can greet Mary and maybe I'll be standing outside. So. Do you know that this is 
just a room until you arrive and bring in the church. It's not a church until you arrive with the Holy Spirit. So we just are so glad that you're here with us this morning. I'm going to give you a little bit of my background, but I want to let you know right off the cuff. I was taught how to preach in the South, and in the South, people talk back when you preach. So I'm going to be okay with that if you want to have a conversation while I'm preaching. So as we open the word together this morning, would you just join me in prayer? Father in heaven, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for all the helpers that were here to welcome Jessica and I and um, that all the hands that helped to unload the truck and to put furniture together and bring me groceries and all those wonderful things. I thank you for the hearts that you have placed in these people. And now, Lord, as we begin our journey together, I pray that these things that you've been teaching to me, you would allow me to teach to them. And I also pray, Lord, that everyone here and at home have come with open ears, open hearts, and open minds to receive whatever it is you have for them this day. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Okay. Well, since we're going to be the church together, I think you might want to know a little bit about me. So, my name is Mary Kendall. I was born and raised in Rochester, New York. I grew up in East Irondequoit. Later on, as I got older, I had a, one home. I owned a home in the city of Rochester. Then later on, I moved and owned a home in Fairport, uh, Perryton. And uh, God has done a lot of moving with me. I lived cent in Central Florida for 15 years. I lived three and a half years in Central Pennsylvania and then two years in western New York before coming here to back to Rochester. I am single. I uh, have one daughter, Jessica. Uh, she is here with me. She graduated from Penn State with a degree in psychology a few years ago. She was living in northern Virginia, but COVID took her job. So she's now living with me here until she finds a new job. Uh, I will tell you my first marriage ended in divorce, and my second marriage ended with the death of my husband in the year 2000. So I am a widow. I have one brother and one sister-in-law, Frank and Karen. They live in Hartford, Connecticut. Frank pastors a non-denominational church. It's a second career for him. He uh, was an engineer for most of his life. They have three grown daughters. All three of them are married, and I can say that today because the third one is actually getting married today. I am missing her wedding today because I didn't think you'd want to give me my first Sunday off. So um, we're celebrating that marriage today. Also, Frank and Karen have one granddaughter, Samantha. Now, I was not called into ministry until later in life. It was after my, the death of my husband. And then I earned a degree in Bible slash ministry, which means church leadership. I then went on for three years of study, in, and I'm certified as a Christian educator. I served United Methodist churches for 12 years in Central Florida. But as I pursued ordination there, I felt like a square peg trying to get slammed into a round hole. I just didn't fit. And so I struggled for a few years because I knew I had a call, and I knew I was going <clears> to <throat> be responsible for that call. And a friend of mine one night said, why don't you come hang out at the Orlando Fellowship of the Free Methodist Church and see what you think there? And on my first night there, I knew I was home. I knew that the Free Methodist Church stayed true to the teachings of Jesus and John Wesley, and that we really focus heavily on the least, the last, and the lost. So I transferred to the Keystone Conference of the Free Methodist Church in 2014, 
I was ordained in 2015. I became the associate pastor of a free Methodist church in a little country church in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, and served there for three and a half years. When I got there, they had this great problem going on. They were experiencing explosive growth, and it was a little teeny old white country church, and we had no space. It's a great problem for a church to have where you're running out of space, and we eventually had to build a new church. So that was an exciting time in ministry. And then in June of 2018, I transferred to the Genesis Conference to be the solo pastor of a church in West Seneca, New York. And then in January or shortly thereafter, pastor, or Superintendent Pam asked me if I would consider an appointment in a different church. And so she gave me a few options. And when I got to Park Ridge, I really started to feel called to Park Ridge. And obviously, your leadership team felt the same way, because here I stand as your lead pastor today. So let me go back even a little further in my life for you. I was raised in a very loving Italian family by a very caring mom and dad. We went to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday after our extended families. If it was in the warmer months, we were usually at a local beach or a park or at my uncle's pool. In the colder months, we were usually gathered in someone's home around a large meal, a lot of food, a lot of conversation, and a lot of yelling. Now, nobody was mad at each other, just Italians tend to yell. And that was how I grew up. My mom was a good and a loving mother. She was a hard worker, and she taught us sound ethics and good family values. Through her example, I learned what it meant to be a woman, a mother, and a wife. My mom taught me about religion, but my mom could not teach me what it meant to have a saving faith in Jesus Christ because my mom could not teach me something that she did not have. Now, that does not in any way take away from the fact that she was a good and a loving mother. Now, even though my brother and I both left the denomination in which we were grown, in which we were raised, neither of us had come to a saving faith until we were in our 30s. Through many conversations that my brother had with my dad, my dad eventually came to believe that Jesus was the Lord and the Savior of his life. And that occurred at 87 years of age, just six years before his death. My mom was still a holdout, though. She had two kids in the ministry, and she couldn't figure out what she did wrong. So <laughs> we realized that, as all salvations are, it was going to be a work of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't going to happen through us. And just before her 84th birthday, seven months before her death, she received Jesus as the Lord and the Savior of her life. And my brother and I were very privileged to be there when it happened. So if you have family or friends that you are concerned about, I want to tell you, I stand here and say, don't stop praying. Don't ever give up hope. God is always at work, and sometimes those closest to us are not going to hear it from us. They may need to hear it from someone else. So that's a little bit of history about me and my family. And as we spend time together in the years to come, I suspect that I will become a part of your family here at Park Ridge, and I'm excited to do that. I guarantee you're going to hear a lot more about me and my family and my past as we get to know each other better. I encourage you to send me a friend request on Facebook. But I'm going to give you a warning first. Especially at this time, 
right now. Social media has a lot of negativity going on. So if you tend to post a lot of memes or make a lot of political statements, I'm probably going to unfollow you for a while just because I think there's a lot of negativity out there. And I think as members of Christ's family and as representatives of his church, I think we ought to be agents of unity and not division. So while I think it's important for all of us to have um, a political statement of our own, I think it's more important for each of us to encourage one another to vote, not to vote for someone in particular. And so I would encourage you to be agents of unity and not division. I'm also going to ask that we covenant together to be those agents of unity and not cause more division. Because if you're not aware, there's a lot of division right now in our country, in our city, and throughout social media. So if you would, I would ask you to covenant with me and let's hold each other accountable to being agents of unity. Let's stand out as shining lights of Jesus Christ for all the world to see. Now, I've come to Park Ridge with an understanding that we have a rich history here, and that's exciting. And I'm excited to see what God has in store for us as we get to know one another. But I've also come with an understanding that we have some challenges ahead of us. And through many conversations that I have with Pastor Dino and the leadership team, one challenge in particular kept coming through. I think I heard it through every single voice that I met with, and that was this. We need younger people here. We need younger people. But I want you to hear me. We may need some more younger people here, but we're going to value every age group here. No one age group is more important than another. We all are important in the family of God. And so I'm excited to see what God will do with us. And I'm going to tell you what I told the board members. I told them that we can say we want younger people here. And I don't think anybody in this room would stand up or anyone at home would stand up and say, no, we don't want any young people here. I think everyone has a desire for that. But what I said is, if we say we want younger people here, then we need to be willing to listen to them and hear from them. And some of the things they may tell us may feel like gut punches to us. Now, we will never change the gospel message. We will never water down the message of Jesus Christ. But we can change how we package it, and we can change how we deliver it so that everyone can feel as though they are welcome here in the family of God. Now, we're facing another challenge. We're doing ministry in the midst of a pandemic. Making this church be what God would have it be is going to take a lot of prayer. It's going to take a lot of faith, and it's going to take a lot of hard work. But your board has assured me that the people of this church are willing to do that hard work and make this church what God would have it be. Were they right? Wow, I wish I had a church here this morning. Were they right? All right, good. Yes, I am glad to hear that. This will be a challenge for us, no doubt. But I believe we have everything we need to be what God would have us be. Thankfully, the church is not an industry that relies solely on the world's economy. The wisest church leaders never focus solely on the world's economy. We focus on kingdom math. The world's economy functions differently 
then the kingdom of God functions. And so we're going to focus on kingdom math and not on arithmetic because the two are very different. So let's look at an example of kingdom math in Matthew's gospel. I hope you brought your scriptures with you. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 14 today. Matthew is the first gospel in the New Testament, so if you get to Mark, Luke, or John, you just went a little too far back up until you get into Matthew chapter 14. I'll begin reading in verse 14. So please listen and receive this word from God this morning. Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. When he went ashore, Jesus saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, and he healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away, that they may go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, And they all ate, and they were satisfied. They picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. There were about 5,000 men who ate, besides the women and the children. Now, Jesus had disciples. Many of them were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. These were not dumb people. They knew how to do arithmetic. They understood that one plus one equals two. And so on this day, all they could see was a problem. Five loaves plus two fish will not feed 5,000 people. So they brought the problem to Jesus. And they laid it before him and they said, you fix it. But Jesus tossed the problem right back to them. He said, no, you fix it. You give them something to eat. And they quickly started making excuses for how this was impossible. They couldn't possibly do it. There wasn't enough food. There were too many people. Jesus, maybe you don't get this. This won't work. It doesn't add up. Jesus doesn't use arithmetic to solve problems. Jesus uses kingdom math. In verses 17 and 18, they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish, and Jesus said to them, bring them here to me. They brought him what they had. And then Jesus turned to his father in prayer. And he relied on the Holy Spirit to solve the problem. See, that's when the miracle happened. Everyone had their fill, Matthew tells us. And there were leftovers. Not a few crumbs, but 12 full baskets of leftovers. See, that's not arithmetic. That's kingdom math. But I studied this passage and found it very interesting because in the very next chapter, Matthew does almost a repeat performance. He tells us another example of kingdom math. So if you just page forward to chapter 15, we're going to see that in verses 32 to 38, it's almost like this miracle is on a rerun. So in 15, 
verse 32, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they've remained with me now three days. Anyone here gone to church for three whole days? Three days they were there. They remained with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to him, Where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And a few small fish. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them, and he started giving them to the and he started giving them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate, and they were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides the women and the children. Now, Matthew spent three years with Jesus. I'm sure he had so many memories that he could have recorded for us. And as I looked at these two passages just so close to one another, I had to ask myself, why would he do this? Why would he tell us almost the exact same story all over again? Why was this memory that important to him? Now, there's some differences. One had 5,000 men, the other 4,000. One has five loaves and two fishes. One has seven loaves and a few fish. One has 12 baskets full of leftovers. The other, seven full baskets. Why run a repeat? You see, I think it's easy for us to focus on the miracle and miss the deeper truth. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were never meant to be just an interesting storybook. They were never meant to just be examples of discipleship. The Holy Spirit inspired these writers to record the events of Jesus that would help us be the church. That includes me and you. Jesus never commissioned us to memorize scripture. He commissioned us to make disciples. That's what he commissioned us to do. And these four gospels make up a DIY discipleship manual. It is meant for us to follow it. These were never meant to just be verses we memorize and teach. They were meant to be understood and followed. One thing is clear in any reading of the Gospels. Jesus loves people. I've only read two passages this morning, but that message is very clear. Jesus loves people. In the first passage... Just before the, past, the part that I read, Jesus had just gotten word that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. And he got into a boat and he wanted to go away and be off by himself for a while. But when he got there, the crowds were waiting for him. And Matthew tells us that Jesus felt compassion for them and he healed them. When the disciples came to him and told him the people were hungry and they, <clears throat> and they didn't have any food, Jesus did all he could to feed them because Jesus loves people. In the second passage, we see Jesus loving people all over again. He had been teaching and healing for three days. 
and he felt compassion for these people because they'd been there with him all that time and they didn't have anything to eat. And he was afraid that if he sent them away, they might faint on the way. I'm sure Jesus was tired. I'm sure he was hungry. But his concern was not for himself. His concern was for all those people. Because Jesus loves people. I don't think that Matthew just simply wants us to know that Jesus loves people. If these words are part of a discipleship manual for us to follow, we are supposed to love people. All people. Not just the people that look like us or think like us or dress like us. We're supposed to love all people. Because Jesus loves all people. Why is it then that we humans decide who it is that we're going to love? I think it's because we focus on the miracle and forget the outcome of those miracles. The outcome was not just that the people were fed and were satisfied, the outcome was that there were leftovers, lots of leftovers. Jesus did not just meet the needs of the people, he exceeded what they needed. Because he loves people, and that is what he does. He gives us more than enough when we ask him. Instead of realizing the enormity of his love, we tend to walk around with a scarcity mentality, right? We do the arithmetic. The numbers on the page don't add up, so we've got to start cutting things. We've got to stop doing ministry. We've got to stop doing this program or that ministry because the numbers aren't adding up. We're doing arithmetic, and Jesus says, no, bring what you have to me. I already know what you don't have, but bring what you have to me. Turn to the Father in prayer and wait for the Holy Spirit to do the miracle of solving the problem. See, that's what we need to do. Stop worrying about arithmetic. Start focusing on kingdom math. So this is how kingdom math works. First, we bring Jesus what we have. We turn to the Father in prayer. And then we rely on the Holy Spirit to fix the problem. That should give us some relief. We don't have to be the problem fixers. As far as I know, the Holy Spirit has not posted his job. That's his job. Now, I don't know how much time had elapsed between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. But no matter how long a period of time had elapsed, could those disciples have forgotten about the feeding of the 5,000? Could they have forgotten the miracle that they witnessed that day? Now keep in mind, Matthew was probably one of those disciples there for both of those. And look what happens in the second one. When Jesus, who had just fed 5,000 people some time ago, we don't know how long, but he had just fed 5,000 people. When, when, the, when Jesus suggested feeding the people, what happens? Where would we get enough food to feed all these people? Let's wring our hands. We don't know. What are we going to do here? It's ridiculous. That scarcity mentality. The numbers don't add up. What more did Jesus have to do to prove to these people that when he's there and his love is there, they don't have to worry about how to get things done? We have a manual that shows us what to do. 
So here's my challenge for each of us at Park Ridge Free Methodist Church. I want you to think back over all the miracles that have happened in your own life. How many times did you sit down with your checkbook and your bills and think, the numbers don't add up? We're not going to be able to do it. And somehow, you did. How many times in the life of the church did you think, man, we're never going to get through this one? And you did. Those are miracles. Because you stopped relying on arithmetic and started relying on kingdom math. Maybe you didn't know that's what it was. But you just put your faith in Jesus, and he and the Holy Spirit showed up big time and made those things happen. So my challenge to you is, through this next week, would you do that? Would you go through your mind and remember those times? Maybe you have a lot of them. Maybe you only have one. But whatever it is, would you actually write that down and remind yourself and then put it somewhere where you're going to see it? Tape it to your bathroom mirror or put it behind your kitchen sink so when you're doing dishes, you're going to remember that. Or maybe tape it next to your computer screen so you're going to see it and just be reminded that Jesus is still on the throne. The Holy Spirit is still at work. Be reminded that Jesus is your provider, not the world's economy. And be reminded that he will not just give you enough, he will give you more than enough. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm so glad that you are who you are. I'm so glad that I don't have to figure out how to solve all the problems. Because you already know the end. I'm so glad that I just need to come and give you what I have. Give you what we have. Turn to your Father, our Father, in prayer. And then just wait for the Holy Spirit to show up and do what only he can do. And I thank you and I praise you in the powerful, in the perfect, in the holy name of Jesus. And everybody here said, amen. As, as Pastor preached, a quick little story came to my mind real quick. There was a time when my kids were little, I was going to college, I was working full time, and it, all my kids are drama. They're like their mom, right? They're all drama, so I'm running them to different drama stuff. And there was a season where I didn't know, I did, had no gas. And I had to pick up two kids in the opposite ends. And I just prayed. I said, Lord Jesus, I'm going to run on faith gas. <laughs> and I did. And you know what? I got both of my babies home. And then when I got home, I had found a 20 underneath the um, couch when I was vacuuming. God always provides those little things, those little reminders that he is more than enough. Amen, church? <laughs> Sing this together. All of you is more than enough for
our minds on that. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for all that you give to us. You are a generous God. You do not ask us to give 90% back to you. You say, no, you keep 90% and just give me back 10% so that my kingdom on earth can expand. And so I pray, Lord, that as we are faithful to you, that we will see your kingdom expand through the ministries of Park Ridge. And I thank you in advance for all the ways that that will happen. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I would ask that you wait for the ushers to uh, direct you out. And as Patty said, I'm going to be obedient and I'm going to go out ahead of you. So uh, we encourage you to fellowship with one another, but because of the pandemic, we can only do it outdoors. And I thank you and I'm excited to see all that we have coming in our future. 